Welcome to the Thousand Nights and One Night. Now, when the six hundred and tenth night she pursued, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Ahmad al Danaf had given the water carrier a she mule and an hundred dinars and said to him, I desire to send a trust by thee. Dost thou know the people uh, of Cairo? I answered, quoth the water carrier, yes. And he said, take this letter and carry it to Ali Zabak of Cairo and say to him, thy captain saluteth thee, and he is now with the caliph. So I took the letter and journeyed back to Cairo, where I paid my debts and plied my water-carrying trade. But I have not delivered the letter, because I know not the abode of Mercury Ali, quoth Ali. O elder, be of good cheer and keep thine eyes cool and clear. I am that Ali, the first of the lads of Captain Ahmad, here with the letter. So he gave him the missive, and he opened it and read these two couplets. O oh, adornment of beauties to thee, right eye, on a paper that flies as the wind goes by. Could I fly? I had flown to their arms in desire, but a bird with cut wings, how shall he ever fly? But after salutation from Captain Ahmad al Danaf to the eldest of his sons, Mercury Ali of Cairo, thou knowest that I tormented Salah al Din the Kareen, and befooled him till I buried him alive and reduced his lads to obey me, and amongst them, Ali Katif al Jamal, and I am now become the town captain of Baghdad in the divan of the Caliph, who hath made me overseer of the suburbs. And thou be still mindful of our covenant come to me. Happily thou shalt play some trick in Baghdad which may promote thee to the Caliph's service, so he may appoint thee stipends and allowances, and assign thee a lodging which is what thou wilt see, and so peace be on thee. When Ali read this letter, he kissed it, and laying it to his head, gave the water carrier ten dinars, after which he returned to his barracks and told his comrades, and said to them, I commend you one to the other. Then he changed all his clothes, and donning a traveling cloak and a tarbouche, took a case carrying a spear of bamboo cane, four and twenty cubits long, made in several pieces to fit one into the other. Quoth his lieutenant, Wilt thou go a journey when the treasury is empty? And quoth Ali, When I reach Damascus, I will send you what suffice you. Then he set out and fared on till he overtook a caravan about to start, whereof were the Shah Bandar, a provost of the merchants, and forty other traders. They had all loaded their beasts except the provost, whose loads lay upon the ground. And Ali heard his caravan leader, who was a Syrian, say to the muleteers, Bear a hand, one of you. But they reviled him and abused him. Quoth Ali in himself, hm, None will suit me so well to travel with all as this leader. Now Ali was beardless and well favored. So he went up and he saluted the leader who welcomed him and said, What seekest thou? replied Ali. Oh, my uncle, I see thee alone with forty mule loads of goods. But why hast thou not brought hands to help thee? rejoined the other. Oh, my son, I hired two lads, and clothed them, and put in each one's pocket two hundred dinars, and they helped me till we came to the dervish's convent, when they ran away. Quoth Ali, Whither are you bound? And quoth the Syrian, To Aleppo, when Ali said, I will lend thee a hand. So accordingly they loaded the beast, and the provost mounted his she-mule, and they set out, he rejoicing in Ali, and presently he loved him and made much of him, and on this wise they fared on till nightfall, when they dismounted and ate and drank. Then came the time of sleep, and Ali lay down on his side, and made as if he were asleep, whereupon the Syrian stretched himself near him, and Ali rose from his stead, and sat down at the door of the merchant's pavilion. Presently the Syrian turned over, and would have taken Ali in his arms, but found him not, and said to himself, Happily he hath promised another, and he hath taken him. But I have the first right, and another night I will keep him. Now Ali continued sitting at the door of the tent till nigh upon daybreak, when he returned and lay down near the Syrian, who found him by his side when he awoke, and said to him, If I ask him where he hath been, he will leave me and go away. So he disassembled with himself, and, and they went on till they came to a forest in which was a cave, where dwelt a rending lion. Now, whenever a caravan passed, they would draw lots among themselves. Him on whom a lot fell, they would throw uh, to the beast. So they drew lots, 
and the lot fell not upon the provost of the merchants. And lo, the lion cut off their way, awaiting his prayer. Wherefore the provost was sore distressed, and said to the leaders, Allah disappoint the fortunes of the far one, and bring his journey to naught. I charge thee after my death, give my loads to my children. Quoth Ali, the clever one, What meaneth all this? So they told him the case, and he said, Why do you run from the tomcat of the desert? I warrant you, I will kill him. So the Syrian went to the provost and told him of this, and he said, If he slay him, I will give him a thousand dinars. And said the other merchant, We will reward him likewise, one and all. With this, Ali put off his mantle, and there appeared upon him a suit of steel. Then he took a chopper of steel, and opened it, turned the screw, after which forth alone, and standing in the road before the lion cried out to him, the lion ran at him, but Ali of Cairo smote him between the eyes with his chopper and cut him in sunder, whilst the caravan leader and the merchants looked on. Then said he to the leader, Have no fear, O Nuncle. And the Syrian answered, saying, O my son, I am thy servant for all future time. Then the provost embraced him and kissed him between the eyes and gave him the thousand dinars, and each of the other merchants gave him twenty dinars. He deposited all the coin with the provost, and they slept that night till morning, when they set out again, intending for Baghdad, and fared on till they came to the lion's clump, and the wadi of dogs, where lay a villain Badawi, a brigand, and his tribe, who sallied forth on them. The folk fled from the highwaymen, and the provost said, My monies are lost when lo! Up came Ali in a buff coat, hung with bells, and bringing out his long lance, fitted the pieces together. Then he seized one of the Arab's horses, and mounting it, cried out to the Badwai chief, crying, Come out to fight me with spears. Moreover, he shook his bells, and the Arab's mare took fright at the noise, and Ali struck the chief's spear and broke it. Then he smote him on the neck and cut off his head. When the Badawins saw their chief fall, they ran at Ali, but he cried out, saying, Aloha Akbar, God is most great, and falling on them, broke them and put them to flight. Then he raised the chief's head on his spear point and returned to the merchants who rewarded him liberally and continued their journey till they reached Baghdad. Thereupon Ali took his money from the provost and committed it to the Syrian caravan leader, saying, When thou returnest to Cairo, ask for my barracks and give these monies to my deputies. Then he slept that night, and on the morrow he entered the city and, threading the streets, inquired for Calamity Ahmad's quarters, but none would direct him thereto. So he walked on till he came to the square of al Nafs, where he saw children at play. Amongst them he called for Ahmad al Lakit and said to himself, O oh my Ali, thou shalt not get news of them, but from the little ones. Then he turned, and seeing a sweet meat seller, brought Hawa of him, and called to the children. But Ahmad al Lakit drove the rest away, and coming up to him said, What seekest thou? Quoth Ali, I had a son, and he died, and I saw him in a dream asking for sweetmeats, wherefore I have brought them, and wish to give each child a bit. So saying, he gave Ahmed a slice. And he, looking at him and seeing a dinar sticking to it, said, Be gone, I am not a catamite. Seek among, uh, another one. Quoth Ali, O my son, none but a sharp fellow taketh the hire, even as he is sharp one who giveth it. I have sought all day for Ahmad al Danaf's barracks, but none would direct me to it therefore. So this dinar is thine, and thou wilt guide me thither. Quoth the lad, I will run before thee, and do thou keep up with me till I come to the place when I catch up a pebble with my foot and kick it against the door, and so shalt thou know of it. Accordingly, he ran on and Ollie after him till they came to the place, and when the boy caught up a pebble between his toe and kicked it against the door, so he made known the place where he lived. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased saying her permitted say. Now, when it was the seven hundred and eleventh night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Ahmad the abortion had made known the place, Ali laid hold of him, and would have taken the dinar from him, but could not. So he said to himself, hm, Go, thou deservest largesse, for thou art a sharp fellow, whole of wit and stout of heart. Inshallah, 
If I become a captain of the caliph, I will make thee one of my lads. Then the boy made off, and Ali Zaybak went up to the door and knocked. Whereupon quoth Ahmad al O O doorkeeper, open the door. That is the knock of Quicksilver, Ali the Kareem. So he opened the door, and Ali entered and saluted with the salam. Ahmad, who embraced him, and the forty greeted him. Then Calamity Ahmad gave him a suit of clothes, saying, When the caliph made me captain, he clothed my lads, and I kept this suit for thee. Then they seated him in the place of honor, and seating out meat, they ate well, and they drank hard, and made merry till the morning, when Ahmad said to Ali, Beware, thou walk not among the streets of Baghdad, but sit thee still in this barracks. Asked Ali, Why so? Have I come hither to be shut up? No, I came to look about me and divert myself, replied Ahmad. O my son, think not that Baghdad be like Cairo. Baghdad is the seat of the caliphate. Sharpers abound therein, and rogueries spring thereof, as warts spring out on the earth. So Ali abode in the barracks three days, when Ahmad said to him, I wish to present thee to the caliph, that he may assign thee an allowance. But he replied, When the time cometh. So he let him go his own way. One day, as Ali sat in the barracks, his breast became straightened, and his soul troubled, and he said to himself, Come, let us up and thread the ways of Baghdad, and broaden my bosom. So he went out and walked from street to street, till he came to the middle bazaar, when he entered a cook shop and dined, after which he went out and he washed his hands. Presently he saw forty slaves, with forty bonnets and still cutlets, come walking two by two, and last of all came Delilah the Wily, mounted on a she-mule with a gilded helmet, which bore a ball of polished steel, and clad in a coat of mail, and such like. Now she was returning from the divan to the khan, of which she was portress, and when she espied Ali, she looked at him fixedly, and saw that he resembled Calamity Ahmad in height and breadth. Moreover, he was clad in a striped abba cloak and a burnous, with a steel cutlass by his side, and similar gear with valor shone from his eyes, testifying in favor of him, and not disfavor of him. So she returned to the khan, and going into her daughter, fetched a table of sand, and struck a geomatic figure, whereupon she discovered that the stranger's name was Ali of Cairo, and that his fortune overcame her fortune and that of her daughter. Asked Zainab, O my mother, what hath befallen thee that thou hast recourse to the sand table? Answered Delilah, O my daughter, I have seen this day a young man who resembled Calamity Ahmad, and I fear lest he come to hear how thou didst strip Ahmad and his men, and enter the khan, and play us a trick in revenge for what we did with his chief and the forty, for methinks he was taken up this lodging in Aldenoff's barracks. Zainab rejoined, What is this? He thinks thou hast taken his measure. Then she donned her fine clothes and went out into the street. When the people saw her, they all made love to her, and she promised and swear and listened and coquetted, and passed from market to market till she saw Ali the Kareem coming. When she went up to him and rubbed her shoulder against him, then she turned and said, Allah, give long life to folk of discrimination. Quoth he, How goodly is thy form, to whom dost thou belong? And quoth she, to the gallant like thee. And he asked, Art thou wife or spinster? Married, said she. Asked Allah, Shall it be my lodging or thine? And she answered, <laughs> I am a merchant's daughter and a merchant's wife, and in all my life I have never been out of the doors till today. And my only reason was that when I made ready food, <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> When I made ready food and thought to eat, I had no mind thereto without company. When I saw thee, love of thee entered my heart, so wilt thou deign solace my soul and eat a mouthful with me? Quoth he, Whoso is invited, let him accept. Thereupon she went on, and he followed her from street to street. But presently he bethought himself and said, What wilt thou do, and thou a stranger? Verily, tis said, Whoso do whoredom in the strangerhood, Allah will send him back disappointment. But I will put her off from thee with fair words. So he said to her, <clears throat> Take this sonar and appoint me a day other than this, 
And she said, By the mighty name, it may not be, but thou shalt go home with me as my guest this day, and I will take thee to fast friend. So he followed her till she came to a house with a lofty porch and a wooden bolt on the door, and said to her, Open this lock, asked he. Where is the key? And she answered, Tis lost. Quoth he, Whoso openeth a lock without a key is a knave whom it behooveth the ruler to punish, and I know not how to open doors without keys. With this she raised her veil, and showed him her face, whereat he took one glance of eyes that cost him a thousand sighs. Then she let fall her veil on the lock, and repeated over it the names of the mother of Moses, opened it with a key, and entered. He followed her, and saw swords and still weapons hanging up, and she pulled off her veil and sat down with him. Quoth he to himself, Accomplish what all I have decreed to thee, and bent over her to take a kiss of her cheek. Then she caught the kiss upon her palm, saying, This beseemeth not but by night. Then she brought a tray of food and wine, and they ate and drank, after which she rose and, drawing water from the well, poured it over the ewer over his hands, whilst he washed them. Now, whilst they were on this wise, she cried out and beat upon her breast, saying, My husband had a signet reed of ruby, which was pledged to him for five hundred dinars, and I put it on, but was too large for me, so I straightened it with wax, and when I let down the bucket, that ring must have fallen into the well. So turn thy face to the door, the while I doff my dress, and go down into the well and fetch it. Quoth Ali, "'Twere shame on me that thou shouldest go down there. I being present, none shall do, I save I. So he put off his clothes, and tied the rope about himself, and she led him down into the well. Now there was much water therein, and said to him, "'The rope is too short. Loose thyself and drop down.' So he did loose himself from the rope, and dropped into the water, in which he sank fathoms deep, without touching the bottom, while she donned her mantilla, and taking his clothes, returned to her mother. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. Now, when it was the seven hundred and twelfth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Ali of Cairo was in the well, Zainab donned her mantilla, and taking his clothes, reached to her mother, and said, I have stripped Ali the Egyptian, and cast him into the Emir Hassan's well, once alas for his chance of escaping. Presently, the Emir Hassan, the master of the house, who had been absent at the divan, came home, and finding the door open, said to his see, Why dost thou not draw the bolt? O oh, my lord, replied the groom, indeed, I locked it with my own hand. The mayor cried, As my head liveth, some robber hath entered my house. Then he went in and searched, but found none, and said to the groom, Fill the ewer that I may t make the wazoo ablution. So the man lowered the bucket into the well, but when he drew it up, he found it heavy, and looked down and saw something there and sitting. Whereupon he let it fall into the water, and cried out, saying, Oh, my lord, an ifrit came up out to me of the well, replied the emir. Go and fetch four doctors of the law, that they may read the Koran over him till he go away. So he fetched the doctors, and the emir said to them, Sit round this well, and exercise this ifrit. They did as he bade them, after which the groom and another servant lowered the bucket again, and Ali clung to it, and hid himself until it patiently, till it came near the top, when he sprang out and landed among the doctors, who fell a-cuffing one another, crying out, Ifrit! Ifrit! The emir looked at Ali, and seeing a young man, said to him, Art thou a thief? No, replied Ali. Then what dost thou in the well? asked the emir, and Ali answered, I was asleep and dreamt a wet dream. So I went down to the Tigris to wash myself, and dived whereupon the, carried, the current carried me under the earth, and I came up in this well. Quoth the other, Tell the truth. So Ali told him all that had befallen him, and the emir gave him an old gown and let him go. He returned to Kalamni Ahmad's lodging and related to him all that had passed. Quoth Ahmad, did I not warn thee that Baghdad is full of women who play tricks on men? And quoth Ali Katif al-Jamal, I conjure thee by the mighty name, tell me how it is that thou art the chief of the lads of Cairo, and yet hast been stripped by a girl? 
This was grievous to Ali, and he repented him of not having followed Ahmad's advice. Then the calamity gave him another suit of clothes, and Asaz Shuman said to him, Dost thou know this young person? No, cried Ali. And Hazaz rejoined, "'Twas Zainab, the daughter of Delilah the Wily, the portress of the Caliph's Khan. And hast thou fallen into her toils, O Ali? Quoth he, Yes. And quoth the son, O Ali, twas she who took thy chief's clothes, and those of all his men. This is a disgrace to you all. And what thinkest thou to do? I propose to marry her. Put away that thought far from thee, and console thy heart of her. O oh, Hassan, do thou counsel me how I shall do to marry her? With all my heart, if thou wilt drink from my hand and march unto my banner, I will bring thee to thy will of her. I will well. So Hassan made Ali put off his clothes, and taking a cauldron, heated therein somewhat as it were pitch, whereover he anointed him, and he became like a blackamoor slave. Moreover, he smeared his lips and cheeks and penciled his eyes with red coal. Then he clad him in a slave's habit, and giving him a tray of kebabs and wine, said to him, There is a black cook in the Khan, who requires from the Tsar only meat, and thou art now become his like. So go thou to him civilly, and accost him in a friendly fashion, and speak to him in the black's lingo, and salute him, saying, "'Tis long since we met in the Birkin. He will answer thee. I have been too busy on my hands be forty slaves, for whom I cook dinner and suppers, besides making ready a tray for Delilah and the like for her daughters, Zainab and the dog's food. And do thou say to me, Come, let us eat kebabs and lush swipes. Then go with him into the saloon, and make him drunken, and question him of his service, how many dishes and what dishes he hath to cook, and ask him of the dog's food, and the keys of the kitchen, and the larder, and he will tell thee. For a man, when he is drunken, telleth all he would conceal where he was sober. When thou hast done this, drug him, and don his clothes, and sticking the two knives in thy girdle, take the vegetable basket, and go to the market, and buy meats and greens, and which do thou return to the Khan, and enter the kitchen, and the larder, and cook the food, dish it up, and put bang in it, so as to drug the dogs, and the slaves, and Delilah, and Zainab, and lastly serve up. When all are asleep, hie thee to the upper chamber, and bring away every suit of clothes thou wilt find hanging there. And if they have a mind to marry Zainab, bring with thee also the forty carrier pigeons. So Ali went to Khan, and going into the cook, saluted him and said, "'Tis long since I have met thee in the beer can." And the slave replied, "'I've been busy cooking for the slaves and the dogs.' Then he took him, and making him drunken, questioning him of his work, quoth the kitchener, "'Every day I cook five dishes for dinner, and the like for supper, and yesterday they sought of me a sixth dish, yellow rice, and a seventh, a mess of cooked pomegranate seeds.' Ali asked, And what is the order of thy service? And the slave answered, First, I serve up Zainab's tray, next, Delilah's. Then I feed the slaves and give the dogs their sufficiency of meat, and the least that satisfies them is a pound each. But as fate would have it, he forgot to ask for the keys. Then he drugged him and donned his clothes, after which he took the basket and went to the market. Then he bought the meat and the greens, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. And so do I cease the telling of these tales for today, till it be morrow.